Santa, budgetarily, you can justify making a cocktail. So first thing we want to do is just take your jigger. I'm going to measure out just an ounce. An ounce of what? An ounce of scotch. Oh, I'm not muted. Sorry. Nope. Um, but it was a good question. Uh, yeah. The scotch is the answer. As with so many things, scotch is the answer. So I love scotch. I'm a huge fan. We smell that. We can smell the kind of honey and like orangey citrus notes. And I could talk about this for a while, but instead of that, uh, we have somebody here with us from Glen Morangi. Dan uh, is tuning in from, did you say Idaho or Iowa? I'm in Nebraska, actually. Nebraska. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, so a bit of a jaunt from where you all are. Same corn, wrong uh, state. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so yeah, obviously we're we're honored to be a part of this presentation. Uh, Glamorgi La Santa, uh, as Shannon has pointed out, is a fantastic cocktail whiskey. There is uh, there is a um, there is a misconception out there that. Single malt Scotch whiskey doesn't belong in cocktails. Of course, it's absolutely false. It belongs wherever you want it to be, uh, wherever you think it works best. Whatever makes your face happy is the right thing to do with single malt Scotch whiskey. Uh, La Santa is our expression from Glamorgie. So if you're looking at the Glamorgie range of uh, Scotch whiskeys, there's nothing smoky about them. If, if your perception of Scotch whiskey that it's, that is that it's all smoky, it isn't. Uh, there are there are peated elements in, in a lot of different blends. There are certainly peated single malt scotch whiskeys. Glamorgi uh, as a distillery is not one of them. Uh, it's one of the things that makes it a bit more malleable uh, in the world of the cocktail. As Shannon mentioned this, uh, uh, you've got on the shelf, you've got about a, a very high 40s or low 50s price point. So, you know, it's, it's not the cheapest thing in the world, but it's not a debilitating price point in terms of using it in a cocktail. So the liquid that you're using, it is a 12 year old product. It spent its first 10 years maturing in a uh, cast that used to hold uh, bourbon. So we'd call those ex bourbon oak casts. Then its final two years are spent maturing in casts that used to hold either Oloroso or Pedro Jimenez sherry. So Spanish fortified white wine. You can usually tell the influence of sherry on single malt scotch because it tends to give off a kind of a chewy, nutty, toffeed, dates, uh, cloves, maybe a cigar box kind of a vibe. Uh, so those tend to be the whiskeys that have seen at least a little bit of their time in cast that had previously held sherry. So that's what you've got here, bottle at 43 ABV or 86 proof, then unpeated coastal North Highland malt from the Glamorgia distillery, 10 years in ex-bourbon oak, two years in uh, uh, ex-sherry oak, either the dessert style sherry, PX, or a medium dry chewy style of sherry called Oloroso. Uh, I tend to make uh, Rob Roy's uh, uh, just one after the other with it, and I love it, but I'm really looking forward to digging into this cocktail. Uh, so I've got all my gear laid out, and uh, Shannon, I'm ready to take the next step if you are ready to to guide us. If anybody's got any questions about the Scotch whiskey as we go along, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, beyond that, I'm going to chef up some drinks here uh, with, uh, with some expert guidance, and we'll move forward if we're ready. Uh, oh, definitely. Thank you so much, Dan. And please take him up on any questions in the chat. That'd be great. Uh, once again, I wanted to thank you for your patience. We had some Wi-Fi issues. We tried to do this in our basement, which sounded like a great idea on paper. Uh, apparently, it was not a good idea in practice. <laughs> so I appreciate your patience. We're gonna start right now with just prepping some stuff because we have the little scotch to sip on. So everybody chill out. We're gonna get to those cocktails. Maybe just a quick sip. Hmm, that's what I'm talking about. I really like, especially for cocktails, uh, there's a lot of Scotch whiskeys that finish with sherry. It's a very popular move for obvious reasons. Uh, and this is certainly one of them that I love. Uh, Dan, if I could ask you one quick question. It says 10 years and two years. Is this a blend of different barrels that all do that same transition? Yeah, so they all would. Um, you would all, uh, all that liquid would have, 
it's essentially everything that you know, goes into either La Santa Cantaruban or Nectar Door starts at life, its life looking a whole lot like Lamorgi original. Then at the end of 10 years, it's either sold as original or something else happens to it. In this case, yeah, every drop would have been re-racked either into, and it's about 50-50 to be honest, uh, depending on the batting. Uh, about half of it goes into ex Oloroso cast. The other half goes into uh, ex Pedro Jimenez cast, that, that uh, rich, unctuous, sweet style of, of sherry making. Uh, and then they're blended back together uh, after uh, that additional two years, cut to 43 ABV and out the door as La Santa. Outstanding. And that's also worth pointing out, you mentioned uh, that the PX or Pedro Jimenez, really unctuous style of sherry, very raisinated, very syrupy. Oloroso is also a big and rather rich style. So you're not using any Fino, Montanilla, any of those light salinity kind of ones. Not in this whiskey in particular. We use all of those in different styles of whiskey that we've made in, in some of our uh, one-off releases here and there, and they're, but they're beautiful. But for La Santa, it's all either Oloroso or PX. And for 18, uh, a bit of 18 is finished in Oloroso. There's some Oloroso use in Signet as well. Nice, nice. Okay, so lime. We're going to take, we're just going to cut the end off right there. And then we're going to cut... Just one coin off like that. We're gonna take from the center out like that and go like that and put that to the side. Okay, so I've used my cut board. It is out of the way. I've made my garnish for drink number two. And now we're gonna start with that first drink, the Don. Uh, Dan was really nice to mention my favorite cocktail in the world earlier, which is, which is a Rob Roy. And I believe in the extra great cocktail section of your thing, I probably mentioned a Rob Roy. It is one of my favorite cocktails, period. Um, and La Santa would be a great scotch in that, in, that, in that cocktail. I wanted to try something different to let you see how versatile a, a, a spirit like scotch can be. So we're going in a whole different direction tonight with the cocktails. So this first one, we're using Oh, let me just go through this a little bit. When we're looking at the list of ingredients and you see three dashes of bitters, that's the smallest increment of any of our fluid. Almost all the time when we do this, we're gonna start with the smallest and work up. So although it's written to read two ounces first, we're gonna start at the bottom there with three dashes and work up. Two reasons. Um, the main reason, uh, is that the less I use of something, it's probably the least amount of money I have in there. And just in case you're making drinks at home and you have one bottle of La Santa, you don't wanna get mostly the way through making your drink, mess it up and then have wasted delicious booze. So start with a little bit of ingredients, work your way up. So three dashes of Angostura. I cheat and uh, change the bottle of Angostura, but you probably have one that's wrapped in the white paper. Now you saw that that was a dash, like hot sauce, not a drop. Drop is and it's, a drop, yes ma'am. It's the orange one, correct? Angostura orange. No ma'am, uh, it's, Ang it's Angostura. I see. I think I only have the Angostura orange bitters. Well, oh. I'm not going to tell you that orange and scotch don't love each other, because they do, uh, especially this, this scotch. If we're smelling it neat, you're going to taste, you're going you're to pick up some kind of like almost orange, orange oil on the nose. Hmm. So that's going to work. And we know you like to use some other ingredients. We've been down this road before. Um, okay. So our next ingredient, I'm gonna use the tropical tonic. As with all of our syrups, flip them over, turn them over. We make them with real stuff. So some stuff might fall out of suspension. Give it a quick shake. Tropical tonic is like our regular tonic in that it's bittered with cinchona bark, which is the source of quinine, which makes tonic tonic. Um, but this one, some of the water has been replaced with uh, pineapple juice and some of the spices have been added, more like allspice, cloves, cinnamon, some of those tropical 
uh, spices that we like. So a quarter ounce of tropical tonic right in there. So we're gonna hint at how, and we're gonna nail home this point on the next drink, but I'm just gonna allude on this drink to how well pineapple and scotch go together. And then our fortified aromatized wine, which Koki Americano Bianco, that's a quarter ounce as well. And then last, but certainly not least, two ounces of scotch. So one and two. There you go. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit, he says boldly. Oh, they stole my straws. I'm going to give it a little stir without putting any ice in there. Yeah, just making sure. Oh, yeah. Okay, so. So the drink with the orange bitters isn't really going to show. Uh, um, it's not going to lean as hard on those tropical spices, but it's going to taste pretty good. So I'm going to take four or five nice cubes. I'm gonna grab my glass, in this case, the coupe, and then I'm gonna stir. And when we're stirring, we've talked about this before, but for those tuning in for the first time, what we're doing is we're literally putting the back of the spoon against the inside of the glass and just letting the spoon stir and just like spin in your hand. You're not really worried about the ice, as long as the spoon will go, the ice will follow. So I like to spin the glass with my hand. I don't want to hold it because I don't want to warm the glass up, but I also want to feel as the glass is getting colder from the inside out. And once it gets cool, I know it's good. Now you can either use a Hawthorne strainer, which is nice, or just use your spoon. Hold the ice back. Strainer works just fine. If you don't feel comfortable doing this, don't do it. And then it says flamed orange coin. There's the orange. We're gonna take a paring knife like this. If you wanna cheat and use a peeler, it'll work. But I'm gonna do a coin rather than kind of a swath. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flatten the edge of the orange with my thumb, and then I'm gonna take the peeler the paring knife rather, and just cut like a 50 cent piece of uh, orange out. Keeping in mind, the orange side has the oils, the white side is pith. The orange side is the only thing we want. So we're gonna take this and touch it ever so gently around the edge of the glass. Smell, should already be able to get some of that orange and then take this guy. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pinch this uh, coin straight over the top, not down, but straight over the top from the side through a lighter. So when you flame a coin, you take your lighter, you go boop, 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 that's it. You're just gonna heat the oils up a little bit. I'm gonna have this lighter right next to my glass and then pinch. Everybody get that? and then smell. Hmm. Oh yeah. Ah, I see what's going on here. I forgot to include lighter in the essential tools. So if you don't have a lighter and you wanna just ex express the orange, you can do that. You're gonna miss one little note, but it's gonna be good. Just like, you know, improvise, overcome, just like orange bitters for Angostura, it's gonna work. Um, but otherwise, take a second, find that lighter and get to it. Remember, you want the oils to go across, not down. Because if you go down, 
it's going to take some of the gas from the lighter and push it on top of your drink. And you don't want that. That's a good okay. Point. Let's smell that. This is terrific, by the way. Hmm. Oh. Yeah. Can you show yeah. us how to do the can you show us how to do the coin again, please? I'll be happy to. The, the cutting of it or just the lighting of it? I'll do the whole thing. First, I take a paring knife. Then I take my orange. Thank then I you. take my thumb and then I push it down. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to flatten the fruit right there. So when I cut, I don't get any fruit. You know, I just want the coin. I'll do that again. What are you doing? Just like that. Aside. And we're just cutting mm. Mm. like that. that See? Yummy. Very yummy. We don't want to get much, if what any. Do we know about this? He said it's fortified wine. So now we've got vermouth. <laughs> and, okay. Exactly. Well, vermouth is also a fortified wine. Okay. So mm. now there's your coin. I don't want to double my, my, my drink, but let's pretend this is the edge of the drink, right? I just took my coin, I just touched it to the edge here and here. I took my lighter and just ran it through the flame like twice, not a lot. And then I'm gonna, when I, when I snap this, when I just push it together, um, it's gonna send the oil across the top of the glass and then some of it'll fall down on top of the glass. So I'm just gonna do, send that oil through the lighter. So when it falls down on the glass, you got burnt oil. Um, and this, for those who you like wine, I like to think of it uh, like wine. They, they say a good wine, and in this case, a good cocktail, should deliver on the palate what it promised on the nose. So one way to, to get, now we know this isn't smoky, uh, but one way to get a little more of that smoke flavor that you're getting from charred oak barrels, this did sit in a whiskey barrel, which is a charred oak barrel for 10 years, uh, is to put a little bit on the nose. So it kind of gives you like, oh, hmm. And then you put it in your mouth, you're like, oh yeah, there it is. Did you drop hmm. the orange in the cocktail? I did, okay. I did, but I did it. I mean, it's aesthetic at this point. You don't have to, uh, but if you do, try to, drop, try to slide it in so the orange is facing up. Because who wants to see Pip? Really. Mm. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, scotch. Questions, comments, concerns. There's a richness there that plays really nicely off of the chewy, toffeed elements of, of La Santa. Uh, and, and yet, the thing about Glamour juice, there's a there is a, a citrus underpinning, particularly with La Santa. There's an orange thing happening just organically there. Uh, so you've taken that the, the 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 somewhat chewy richness and the orange elements, orange oil elements of La Santa, and married them to this to this cocktail base. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, well done. Thank you. Glad you like it. Glad you like it. I cheated. I drank a bunch of them. Oh yeah. Okay. Any questions from the the amassed assembly? Okay. We're gonna move on. To our next drink. I've said this before, and I, I hope it bears out. So we're gonna ask everybody at the end what their favorite one was. And usually what happens, if we do it right, is that a third of the crowd says the first one was their favorite. A third of the crowd says the second was their favorite. And the last third says the third one was their favorite and thinks the other two thirds of the crowd are just crazy. Um, I love a Spirit Ford cocktail. I like most cocktails, quite frankly, most styles of cocktails, not most cocktails. Um, but my wife is never gonna ask me for a Spirit Ford cocktail. She's just not going to, it's not gonna happen. So I know if I make these three cocktails, I can tell you which one she's gonna like, or she's gonna say is the best, and it's not gonna be the one that I say is the best. <laughs> so if this isn't your bag yet, patience, we are getting there. Okay, so next one is the Yacht Rocksman. I can think of no better beverage for the Yacht Rocker uh, than scotch. Um, 
So here we go. This one's gonna go in a double O fashion, which is the glass that looks like that. But we're gonna get a little fancier than you normally would when you're making stuff at home. And we're gonna, we're gonna make this in the mixing glass. We're gonna shake it quick and pour it over fresh ice, okay? So we're gonna want a few things to have in order. Ah, there it is. You want some soda water? You wanna make sure it's nice and cool. Uh, soda water, or anything that contains carbonation, contains carbonation at temperature, meaning the cooler it is, north of frozen, uh, the better it holds the carbonation. So if you have tepid soda water and you're wondering why it just doesn't have the fizz, that's why. Okay, so I'm gonna put that over there. I say by opening a fairly tepid bottle of soda water. Um, okay, here we go. We're gonna go, now this is gonna be a little out of order, so stick with me. We're gonna go with the tropical tonic first. As a general rule, when you're making drinks, uh, we're using the smallest amount to largest amount, but we're also using, this is where we deviate, the stickiest or the sweetest amount uh, or the sweetest ingredients before the drier, acid, and then booze. Why is that? Because I want to clean my jigger out. Otherwise, like the sugary things like syrups are the most likely to stick inside the jigger, right? But I want them in my glass. I don't want them in the jigger. So I'm going to do like I always do with these syrups and turn them over or give them a quick shake. And then this one calls for three quarters of an ounce of the tropical tonic. to a half ounce of lime. Now, if you don't have a half ounce of lime handy, lime juice handy, like I do, you can always just take that lime you had and juice it. Normally I have my handy dandy juicer here. I know I'm showing them peanut gallery. Okay, so this is good because I can juice right to an ounce or half an ounce rather. See where the line is on my jigger and I juiced just a hair north of that. And I say a hair north of it because I'm gonna use my fine mesh strainer and just strain the pulp out. And then last, but certainly not least, second to last, I'm gonna use that ounce and a half Lenmorangi Lasanta. Then we get that cold glass. Got our cold double old fashioned. If you had yours chilled with ice, now's the time to dump that ice. Put that right there. I'm gonna do something a little, in the old days when we used to build these drinks, we always put the, the uh, soda water on last. Uh, and sometimes we still do, but for this, uh, you'll, we're gonna do it a little differently. I'm gonna put some fresh ice right here. And then just pour my two and a half, three ounces right there. And then, we're gonna do like a nice quick shake here. Now you might've, that's it. That is the whole thing. No sense taking longer. We're pouring that right on. Cause when we're shaking longer, we're A trying, we shake to get things cold and diluted. But we're about to pour this in here, which is already cold ice and it's diluted from the soda water. So I don't really need those. So my, my mission in life with this drink is to shake it just long enough to make this drink not temp up. I want my, my fluid to be cold enough so it doesn't, it doesn't make the cold soda water and ice, it doesn't turn them soupy. So then remember that little garnish I cut out earlier? I'm just gonna put that right there on the side like that. Move that out of the way. 
That's why they admire it. Oh yeah, smell that. As soon as you get ready, before you sip it, I beg of you, get a good smell. And once again, you'll get an idea in a different kind of way, how pineapple, which is just, there's a little pineapple juice uh, as part of the syrup. Uh, and those, those spices really do play uh, well with scotch. And not all whiskey is the same. Like I don't try the same tricks with bourbon, quite frankly. It, the flavors are just different enough where scotch really loves pineapple, but you know, bourbon. So. The lime, the lime makes all the difference. It's doesn't lovely. it? Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That lime and this. So this is a refreshing. You can imagine. It's supposed to be seventy six degrees today. What a great one. What a great thing. And thank you for pointing out that that lime and also. Thank you for joining us last night for our industry insider series. We're going to have, um, we're also going to have a, a, the global brand ambassador from Glen Morangi on our on that same series in May. Uh, and if you want to taste some swank Glen Morangi, we'll be doing some kind of Glen Morangi thing at our Wednesday, um, Whiskey Wednesdays, which is our at cost uh, bottle series where we pour usually some prohibitively expensive whiskeys, uh, but you buy them at direct cost. We make no markup. So that way people can afford to taste something that's out of most people's, I want to drink price range. <laughs> and you're doing more in-person things also, I suspect the, the place is opening up. Uh, we are doing service in the alley so far. Uh, we are not serving inside yet. Uh, we will get there, uh, both when all of my staff is vaccinated, 100% vaccinated, uh, and when we can get the right people. So in March of last year, I had to lay off 50 some people at, at between two places. Uh, and we're in the, in the uh, process of rehiring and, and training, because when people come here, we want them to get a certain experience. And you know, we'd rather open up less than open up too much. How does everybody like this one? A completely different experience. You'd mentioned that uh, your wife has a different uh, set of uh, cocktail parameters that she tends to gravitate towards than than you do. Uh, yeah. One thing that cocktail was that my wife and I uh, agree vehemently on is that a drink shouldn't ever be too sweet. I'd love no. that this this maintains a tart brightness. Uh, a ref like you'd mentioned a refreshing kind of a uh, an aesthetic on the on on the palate that uh, that. Sometimes Scotch whiskey cocktails uh, get pigeonholed as being uh, fall, winter. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not that. This is this no. is the this is the flavor of summer. The the uh, somebody had mentioned that the the garnish, the aromatics, that the, the garnish drives that those lime oils, the citrus oils, that uh, that that richness on the nose. It does make a huge difference. And the way that this plays on the palate, I, I had some suspicions regarding pineapple, uh, the essence of pineapple and Glamorgia working well together. But damn, it works even better together than I'd than I'd imagined. So thanks for bringing this to my attention. This is mm. this is absolutely stunning. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm. Well, wow. Yeah. Uh, lots of regulars on the call tonight. Patrick, Patty, Curtis. Cool. Outstanding. Any questions about this or more questions about scotch or questions about anything we've done so far? I don't want to go too fast, uh, but I'll keep going if you will. <laughs> I, I was skeptical. I was skeptical about scotch for cocktails and it's, it's lovely. I am. I'm. I'm I'm a convert. I love it. We've got you on egg whites and scotch now. 
this is great. <laughs> there, there is a malleability with with Scotch whiskey that, uh, and I love bourbon cocktails. I love rye cocktails. Same, same. Uh, they're fantastic. But the the influence of the barrel on on uh, on straight bourbons and straight ryes is something that from the from the conception of a cocktail point of view, you really need to grapple with, and you need to meet it. Uh, you, you need to sort of show up at a knife fight with it with a knife, uh, and so those cocktails <laughs> tend to be you know fairly robust, particularly the spirit forward kind with Scotch whiskeys. And to be fair, Irish whiskeys as well. There's uh, uh, and this isn't the case for all Scotch whiskeys or all Irish whiskeys. So take this with a grain of salt. Um, the the bulk of them have they're they're uh, deceptively malleable because there's a little bit more that the grain brings to the table that the the nuance of that sense of place where the whiskey comes from brings to the table because we use seasoned oak we use used oak so there aren't quite as many overt uh, oak notes in the whiskey itself so you can but there is plenty of depth from the from the grain from the style of distillation from the maturation environment so on and so forth that you can play off of pick notes and accentuate them, pick notes and create in interesting contrast with, and you end up with a cocktail that is that has depth and subtlety at the same time, that in some ways bourbons and rice struggle to achieve that same kind of depth and subtlety simultaneously. Mm. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And scotch tends to, because you said not all scotch whiskeys, uh, I'm gonna just riff on that for a second. Um, Another something else in, in the uh, not with Glenn Morangi, but something else in the same umbrella. You're one of your sister sister brands, Ardbeg. Um, clearly not the same animal. Um, <laughs> you know, an Isla, big, peaty, briny. I love it. Uh, but it's, yeah, exactly. But very different. And we love doing cocktails with with Ardbeg as well. But we clearly do very different um, cocktails <laughs> with our day. Um, let me just have a sip of this to remind myself. Hmm. Excellent. Excellent. So part of the, the theme of this class, and I, I hope everybody's picking up on it so far, is that what he, what, what Dan just mentioned uh, is the versatility of scotch and scotch if I want to sip on big, smoky, peaty scotch, yeah, I'm also thinking fall, winter. Um, but scotch, especially lighter, uh, more kind of finesse-driven uh, brands, and 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 like like Glenmorangie, or some of other ones that won't go mentioned on this because of our guest. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. That's nice. Uh, but there are some others. And scotch, as Dan said, really covers a really much broader uh, flavor spectrum than say most American whiskey, like either bourbon or, or rye whiskey. There's that new first time uh, charred oak barrel to contend with. You're getting so much flavor out of the barrel. And because that's the law, they pretty much all have to have it. And I love those too, but just like he said, you, you got to bring a knife to a knife fight. Uh, <laughs> where is this? clearly we can be a lot more subtle and more refreshing in some cases. Okay, so moving on to our final cocktail. Any questions before we move on? Looks like we got one. Nope, no questions. Okay, seasoned drinkers here. They're like, yeah, yeah, I don't have questions for you. This is great. So our last one, can I, we're called, yep. Can, can I ask so I'm, I'm curious about, I'm curious about, um, sorry for the background noise. I'm curious about the use of a, like a peated scotch in, in that particular cocktail that we just made because in, in like in the past, I have noticed that peated scotch and lime do actually kind of live well together. So I'm kind of, now I'm kind of curious. I personally, I'm obsessed uh, with, with scotch and lime, uh, and mostly because they have no business uh, together. Uh, but what I found, the key to those is bridge ingredients, right? There's a lot of things that like both scotch and lime, but I don't really want scotch, lime, and simple. You know, I don't want like a scotch daiquiri. It's not, that's not what I want. 
Uh, but pineapple and lime and scotch, yes. Uh, cranberry and lime and scotch, yes. So as long as you find, you know, the, the right, you know, arbitration expert ingredient wise, scotch and lime, you can, you can make that, you can make that really work. Another thing about those peated cocktails is it's not really the peat you're picking up on, I don't think, and maybe Dan has an opinion on this. A lot of the, the scotches that, we, that are very, very peaty are also from Isla. They're from the islands. And they have a lot of this kind of briny, iodine-y salinity, which really pairs that part of the flavor profile in my uh, mind, makes, is why you can do that lime thing it's not necessarily the peat. Like if it was a mid, mid Scotland, like Highland Scotch, they decided to peat. I don't know that it would work as well. Dan, do you have an opinion like, on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I tend to, if I'm, I'm considering peated whiskey as part of a, uh, a cocktail, the creative process of making a cocktail happen, I, I particularly if it's got some citric element to it, I try to think of it in the same mindset that I would think of mezcal. So if you are, if you're thinking about peated whiskey and, and lime, for example, uh, it, it works for some, uh, not, not in terms of the production value, but it works in terms of the, the, the flavor harmonies and synergies in some of the same ways that lime and mezcal work together. So if you, if you think of it as sure, it's an aromatics driver, and Shannon makes a good point that uh, a, a good chunk of the uh, of the famous peated whiskeys in Scotland come from an island, and there is a certain amount of of salinity, beachside, uh, um, uh, seaside tang that happens as a part of those things, and it marries very nicely with with tart citrus fruits like lime. Uh, there, there's a synergy there that doesn't necessarily get tapped into all that often. Uh, we usually, if we see, if we're seeing peated whiskeys like Ardbeg included in cocktails. Uh, sometimes it's just as a, a as an atomizer, as an aromatic driver mm. on the top of a cocktail. But you find that you can dig in, particularly with whiskeys like Ardbeg 10 or particularly Wee Beastie, the five-year-old Ardbeg, and mm -hmm. do really creative stuff with it along these lines that you know, I think you'll find uh, uh, ends up being really just intrinsically fascinating in the same way that mezcal cocktails can do uh, some things on the palate that almost no other spirits category can achieve. I was really happy with Wee Beastie. Uh, and it, I think it took me, I didn't want to rush to judgment the first half of the bottle to really make up my mind. Um, <laughs> don't rush. rush into it. Exactly. Uh, I was really happy with, this is a really affordable expression with that much peat on it. And as somebody who likes drinking, that's helpful. But as somebody who likes making drinks for the populace, uh, it's really nice to have something like that in our toolkit that's 40 bucks rather than a hundred bucks. Uh, exactly. Like, so we can bring that note in, especially uh, in ways like you just mentioned. Uh, when people make a penicillin or a lot of cocktails, they'll just waft some Isla over the top to really just tickle the nose and they're not really digging in. But I'm with you, I think, especially for folks that already enjoy smoky sco scotch cocktails. I mean, if you're willing to part with your, with your big smoky whiskey it'll work really well in those cocktails that ask for just a little misted on top i also really love uh big pd scotches in that rob roy example we were talking about earlier it's a very different like this, Ooh, is, this yeah. is really nice and ardbeg is really really delicious also in a rob roy very different cocktail okay right move it Good point. Yeah, thank you for making that point. Uh, and I was just going to make a, a, a very brief point that uh, when we look at uh, cost per ounce for things like this, what you've built there is a, a, a tasting room, a, an opportunity for uh, the public to come in and try things they've never tried before. And the, your opportunity to turn people on to new things is dependent to a degree on the cost of goods, the, the cost yeah. per ounce of the things that you're using so that you don't introduce a cocktail that you love and that you think everybody would have their minds blown by that's $23. That's just, that's cost prohibitive and nobody's going to drink it. Then you can sit there and, you know, conceptualize it and you know that it's awesome. And you're like, I can't not charge 23 bucks for this. So there's a good chunk of the public that's never going to drink it. So when you see whiskey's like like uh, like we beastie and, and certainly original and Lasanta that and, and and to be fair our competitors at, at Monkey Shoulder and so on and so forth it 
opens up a, 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 a page of the playbook that was heretofore cost prohibitive to share with the public in this way. So what you've built there in terms of an, a, a house of experimentation and opening the mind up to new uh, opportunities and new avenues, this, you know, we're always happy to be a part of that, but we understand that it has to make sense fiscally. Uh, and, and so that's, the, you know, like we beastie and stuff like that. That's exactly what we're trying to go for. And in the hands of guys like you, where you, where you look at that and you're like, there's so much, this is a massive playground that I can introduce to more people because of its price point. That's the whole idea. Outstanding, outstanding. And we're happy to have the tools. Um, okay, we're gonna move on to that last cocktail. We're gonna call this one Veil of Tranquility. I don't know where I came up with that name, Dan. Um, but we're gonna yes, start on imagine. this cocktail. <laughs> um, we're gonna start where the line that says three dashes of Angostura, not the line that says three drops of Angostura, okay? So for those who've done these before, this is an egg white cocktail. You know where we're going with this. Um, so we're gonna start with the three dashes. One, two, three. Just like that, get it in there, get it out. And then we're gonna move on. I know it says lime last, but we're gonna skip that. We're gonna go to the sweet ingredients. Uh, we're gonna go Tip that over a few times, make sure. And there's a half ounce of our tropical tonic. Now, this is something you're going to love. Especially, I'm so sorry I didn't get the name of the fellow that liked the lime and scotch. This is your new best friend. This is the pineapple demerara, uh, meaning I use demerara sugar instead of like granulated white. And de demerara, think of it like turbinado or the sugar in the raw packets. It's just like one step less processed than granulated white. So there's just a little more flavor. And like, that's the color. So it'll come out like that. And a half an ounce of that as well. Go ahead and smell that. It's pineapple, but it's also like baked bread. Hmm. So we're now we're like doubling down on our pineapple. Okay, and then a half an ounce of our cookie Americano Bianco. And then the kitchen sink. And then the kitchen sink, exactly. You've done this before. <laughs> so it seems complicated, but notice it was a half an ounce of all three of those things. Same amount, once you find that spot on your jigger, it's just, you know, rote memory, muscle memory at this point, especially for you. Uh, okay, and then a three quarters of an ounce. Now we're really, we're really um, throwing you. Not a half an ounce. This is a three quarters of an ounce. I've pre-squeezed some. So I'm going to do the same side of my jigger. I'm going to do a half and then another quarter or three quarters all day. I did the same side of my jigger because A, I'm not knee deep in the weeds, pineapple upside down cake. Yes, sir. Um, the, uh, I wanna clean that jigger out. I wanna get all that delicious pineapple demerara and tropical tonic in the glass. And the way I can do that is to use the aromatized fortified wine and then the lime to clean it out and put it in the glass. So that's why we do it that way. I know I said it before, it bears repeating. We have a, a drink here that we put on the menu, I don't, I don't know, six years ago. And then we took it off. And then years in between having it on the menu, people would come in and ask for this drink. We called it the Jibe Ho. Uh, for those of you who don't know what jibing is, it's the opposite of tacking on a sailboat. Uh, I was trying to come up with a name for this drink because it was islandy but the scotch we were using. So, you know, there are islands with scotch on them. So I was trying to think nautically. I was like, tacking. And uh, my friend and uh, former coworker at the time was like, what do you got against jibing? Jibing just sounds cooler, doesn't it? Uh, so he was like, uh, so we talk about jibing. I'm like, what is that? He explained it to me. He was into sailing. And then he's like, what you say when you're changing direction 
and the boom is about to swing around is jibe ho, which also sounds like a 70s reference. Uh, so all of that was too good to pass up. So the jibe ho was born. And all that to say is that was a, that was a scotch based pineapple infused um, egg white cocktail. And that kind of gave us the idea for this and many other uh, cocktails. So an ounce and a half of scotch. And then the egg white. So before all that, what we're gonna do is taste it. I got a little straw here. Oh yeah, already really easy to get along with. Like you can imagine if this was just cold, it would be good. But wait until there's some dilution and some egg white. I like to refer to egg white in a cocktail as kind of like the lighting in a Tennessee Williams play. You know, it's everything's shot through gauze somehow. It's soft. Uh, egg white just makes everybody get along. Egg white should not be imparting flavor, however. If it is, it's probably because your eggs are too old. So don't, do, don't use old eggs, use fresh eggs. Uh, so this is how we're gonna do it. Other people do it differently. But the traditional way to do this is to put everything in the glass and shake it and shake it and shake it. And then um, afterwards, um, you add the ice. We're gonna add the ice first. Um, and then we're gonna strain. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shake this cocktail for a bit, and then I'm gonna strain it all off, and then I'm gonna add the egg white. Why am I doing it this way, as opposed to the way people used to do it? Uh, they used to do it the opposite way. I like to do it this way, because when I describe an egg white cocktail, I say, it's like meringue. The egg's not there for the flavor, the egg's there for the structure and the texture, but I would never whip an egg for meringue warm. So we're gonna do it. We're gonna shake the drink first, then we're gonna dump the ice, and then we're gonna put the egg white in there. So here we go. Ice. And then I'm gonna take a drink through a strainer. I don't need this Hawthorne strainer. Hawthorne strainer is the one with the coil or the ice anymore, but I'm gonna take this coil off here. You don't have to do this, but it's a fun little trick. I'm gonna take this and put it right in there. Now I've dumped my ice and I still got my shaker. The good thing about this shaker is it's got a nice thin edge. So I'm gonna get my, I'm gonna crack my egg and I'm gonna just separate the egg like you do if you were making cookies. Uh, I'm gonna do it over here. I don't wanna mess it up and get yolk in my drink just in case I mess it up, which is why your ingredients list says uh, eggs, plural. You only need one but just in case. Okay, quick crack. There you go. Oh, that's a good one. You're gonna dump your egg. You're gonna wash your hands. Come on, wash your hands. Okay, now my coil's here. This coil's literally gonna ask, excuse me, act like a whisk. But before I start shaking, I'm gonna give myself a target, my nice cold glass. So if you have ice hanging out in yours, dump it. Put it right there, take your drink, pour it in, pop. If you're nervous about this, like getting egg white all over yourself, wrap a dish towel around it. Now, we're not going for force or speed, nice long up and down. Uh, you're, I could give you a number, but there is no number to give you of shakes. So we're like shaking to feel the fluff. Oh, I see some good shaking. This is some good shaking. Shannon, have uh, you added the egg yet? Sorry, I was distracted. Yes, yes, I did. 
Okay, thank you. I wouldn't say right it's it. Triple confirm. The egg white goes with the cocktail? Egg white is in the cocktail. The yolk does not. Okay. The whole purpose is the egg white is in the cocktail. And then taking that out. Then I would take my fine mesh strainer, just in case I got um, any, what do you call it? Any shell in there. Also, it has the habit of making the bubbles a little smaller. And then if it's a little short and you have room, just give it a couple of taps and that's it. Easy peasy. Okay, so we're gonna smell it real quick. Okay, that's nice. Now the last ingredient is three drops of Angostura. Now we dashed earlier like that. That's not what we're doing now. We're dropping there. So we're just gonna take it nice and easy. There's the drop, drop, drop. If you're feeling really spunky, go ahead and splurge on four drops. I'm gonna take this and just run that through like that. Hmm. So you can see, I think she's going to give you a good view. Like that. Okay, now, hopefully you smelled it first before you did the three drops, and then smell it again with the drops. Can you smell the difference? Okay. How are we getting there? Are we getting there? We got, anybody got theirs done yet? Oh, there's a, hey, is that a question? Ah, yes. Cheers, everyone. Oh, that's got so about. much depth. Yeah. Hmm. Scotch, I love scotch. So there's another scotch drinker in this house now. She I likes love it. it. She sorry. likes it. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ditto in Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shannon, can you give any tips on breaking the seal? Can I give any tips on what? Breaking, breaking the seal, oh, sorry. with the shaker. Yeah, okay, sorry. So, it's like this, right? Seal it. Because of the thermal change, the, the vacuum gets good. The um, thing to remember is that you only care about the very last millimeter. You don't care about hitting it here. You want to hit it right at the very last, because all you have to do is change this perfect circle for a millisecond. Once you change the very top of it, like it'll it'll come right out. But you don't don't want to hit it here. That's not gonna do anything. That's what normally that's what I used to do when I tried learning. I was like, Meh. so just try to hit it right, right very tip. I, I'm glad someone asked about it. I, I have the same problem. Oh, thank you. I'm so sorry. Thank you. This is why we need questions, because sometimes I'm not very good at this. <laughs> oh, there's some there's some banging. Um, I have a question about um, please the so yours is so beautiful with the uh, egg white kind of or like that foam at the top. So we yeah. Did, I did mine with egg white and he did his without egg white, but. Okay. I is the foam usually because of how long you shake it or like proper shaking or? Yes, so the reason you shake it with ice first and then without ice is because it takes longer to shake for the foam than it does for the cold. So I shake it with ice and I get rid of the ice once it's good and cold and then I have a longer time. If I put it all together, ice and egg white at the same time, by the time I get it frothy enough, it's gonna be soup. Um, does that make sense? It totally does. I was just realizing, I was like, I definitely only shook it once. So I don't remember what oh, <laughs> was with it with no, that ice, but no. yeah, it's okay. Now we got something to aspire to. Okay. Yeah. That's, you know, we live and we learn. So tell me, sir, non egg white drinker. Oh, yeah. What was the uh, impetus? We, you just, the idea of egg white in your cocktail didn't, didn't sit well with you? Yeah. I've never really loved it. So. I oh, you've had it before, though. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Now you're back. No. Okay, cool. Informed decision. <laughs> of course. <laughs> this was great, though. It was funny. We were like, um, I mean, trying the three different ones. Like, I, I'm, I kind of with, with what somebody else said earlier. Like, I am not. I, I thought I was not a Scotch drinker. Like, I have tried a sip of a brand we shall not name. Of you know something that, and I was like, no, this is like I like bourbon. I like whiskey. Um, and I thought after trying the first one that like the, I'm, I love an old fashioned, I love Manhattan. So I was like, oh, this is my bag. But as we've gone through, I don't know, I'm a little torn on the, like on the choosing of which thing, cause they're all very different, but, um, none of which I would have thought had, like, if you would have given it to me at a bar, I, I without telling me, I would never have guessed scotches in any of these. So, um, good news. You don't have to choose. You can have all of them. Uh, and even better news, now we know that you like scotch. Sir, how do you, um, how do you feel about these? Oh, I like it a lot. I think, um, similarly, I've never had uh, scotch cocktails. I usually drink gin, but, um, but yeah, this has been really good. And I love the profile of the last two, probably the best. Can, can I ask you, uh, both of you, uh, you both admitted to not liking scotch or not thinking you like scotch. How did I get you to buy this? Uh, how'd, you, how'd you buy into doing this tonight? <laughs> Why are you spending your evening with me? I'm so happy you're here. Always open, always open to trying different things. So this is, uh, so yeah, just, yeah. They, they want to pull it out completely. Yeah, and, and, and definitely. And like, we, we definitely appreciate cocktails in general. Um, and we've gotten like great cocktail books and living in different cities, we've tried a lot of different cocktails, but, um, but my parents, uh, we live in Boston, so okay. but my parents are in Durham and I'm from Durham. And so um, Nigel's birthday is tomorrow. So they gave Happy birthday. as a birthday gift. This was a, uh, they gave us the class. And so okay. like, is, uh, is, are your parents on the call as well? They are not, they are not. Okay. Um, but I think, yeah, my parents are the Giraffes. If anybody knows them, this is, they're a Durham, they're, they're Durham people, but, um, but they, uh, yeah, we, we were like, oh, scotch would be really interesting. It's not one that we're as, as familiar with. So it was actually a perfect excuse to try something. And as people who live in Boston and don't have the glorious weather that you guys have just yet, mm -hmm. it's really cool. Cause like for us, I mean, they feel like we can, we can go through the seasons the way that our days are like today was 70, but tomorrow's going to be like 20. Mm -hmm. So like tomorrow we can have the refreshing one and feel like we're in the warmth and, you know, kind of go to the fall one the next day. So <laughs> exactly. we're grateful for the, for the variety. Outstanding. Outstanding. Well, Aaron, what right. part of Boston are you in? We're, we're calling in from Foxborough. Oh, nice. We are in Seaport. Okay. Yeah. So like Boston. <laughs> yeah. We're in right. it. We're in it. We're in it. <laughs> okay. Hey, so, Shannon. Yes, please. Hey, it's Allison. Hey, Allison um batching these types of drinks oh. obviously you can't batch an egg white drink um, yeah don't do that you know but you you know you could put all the other ingredients in and just add the egg whites later but yeah you know I would are just, any I've of tried these kind drink. of drinks batchable or is it just carrie's gonna have to keep making the drinks all night long um well if you've got somebody there to make the drinks all night long i'm saying <laughs> but so the one that you're the closest to batchable would be the first one. Uh, and when you batch it, you have to either compensate for dilution. You know, like if you're gonna have, I, is this for a party? Is this for like at home use over the evening? No, like for, no, like maybe, a, you know, when we can all get together again, like maybe a, you know, group of four or a group of six, something like that. Okay, okay, that's a good reason to batch. So yeah, here's the problem with batching. And this egg white cocktail, clearly, a la minute is best. This, this egg white, the foam is going to lose its magic over time, right. right? So you can't really do that. And there's no real upside to batching everything else um, because the pain in the ass is the, is the egg white anyway. So right. that doesn't matter. Uh, the middle one, you can't batch the soda water because that'll die. And citrus in batching is very weird. Um, for some reason, citrus is a very odd thing to batch with. Like if you're batching same day, you can do it. But if you're batching like the day before or something, citrus goes weird in batch cocktails. Um, but also it doesn't act the same way in volume for some reason. So if you're making a batch of something with 
with citrus in it, like use 60% the citrus and taste, and then just keep adding citrus until you get to where you think the flavor should be, because it's probably not gonna need the whole amount of citrus. And I don't understand why that is, okay. but for some reason in, in batch cocktails, the acid seems to grow exponentially and it gets like really assertive. So stirred cocktails, non-citrus cocktails, tend to work the best. Okay. I'll just Thank say you. that. Thank you for that. Of course. More questions, comments, concerns. Shannon, you made a point about uh, the freshness of an egg white, and I, I wanted to sort of uh, address the egg white concerns that were brought up earlier. I think it's a bit like seafood. Um, it should be uh, the, the fresher, the better. Once you start to get the fishy thing off the of seafood, or once you start to get the the chickeny barnyard thing off of an, uh, an egg white cocktail, that's it's it, it it doesn't work and i totally get the trepidation behind that but if it's a if it's a fresh egg white then what it should do the the, the function that it should play in the cocktail should be mouthfeel visuals the that foam uh, whether you whether you do the dry shaker i really like your idea of of getting the chill and the dilution right and then adding the egg white and the agitation afterwards so that you've got supreme control over what's going on there but those that the, this i just made this with the with the freshest egg white I can get my hands on. And there's there's none of that, there's none of that uh, south end of a chicken going north thing that can throw you <laughs> sometimes when you're drinking egg white cocktails. And, and you know, you worry to a certain degree about, okay, this isn't pasteurized, then you worry about salmonella and so on and so forth. There's alcohol in it, which helps, but the, the frequency of, of, of salmonella ca contaminated eggs is, is lower than you think it's gonna be. So just go to the places, if you're gonna, if you're gonna really enjoy egg white cocktails, go to the places that make lots of them because they're, they're moving through their eggs somewhat quickly. Uh, and with this one, man, it, it's, it's, a, it's really about the visuals, the mouthfeel, that creaminess, the depth of character and, and the, the egg white itself doesn't play, a, it shouldn't, as, as Shannon mentioned, it shouldn't play a flavor role, it should play a texture role. If it's playing a flavor role, there's a problem operationally. That that you have fallen victim to. So it's not if you if if you've had an egg white cocktail and you're not into it, not your fault. Uh, that was an <laughs> operational error. I wasn't going to throw whoever his bartender was at drink or wherever in Boston he's getting his cocktails under the bus. Right. But what he said, <laughs> outstanding. Any um, questions, comments, concerns? I'm so happy that we've got some scotch, um, you know, conformists, not conformists, was that conversions? <laughs> really happy about that. We are and that's a lifelong mission of mine. And Mezcal, as he mentioned earlier, I'm also a huge fan. Bartenders in general just want people to experience the coolest stuff. Um, and as long as you can get one who respects your flavor profile like what you tell them you want and what you are interested in hopefully you can get um you can get them to get you something new that still fits right within your wheelhouse we're heading into extra innings here and i don't want to take up everyone's night uh or in dance i'm really happy that dan's been able to join us here uh i wanted to let people know that our next one of these monthly classes is the 8th of April. We're gonna do brandy. So folks that, you know, are open-minded to both scotch and brandy, good on you. This one's gonna be delicious. I believe we're gonna use cognac, which is an amazingly versatile and a, unlike scotch, a real important classic cocktail ingredient. Um, scotch and mezcal, as he mentioned, bartenders love because they're not actually huge uh, cocktail, classic cocktail ingredients. So it's kind of tabula rasa, making up all kinds of cool stuff. <laughs> um, where, so we have our monthly class. And as some of you on the line tonight, we're, we're on last night for our Industry Insider series, which is free, um, where we interview people from the industry uh, about industry stuff. Uh, we get a lot of, distillers or brand ambassadors to talk about kind of the nuts and bolts of booze. And um, 
we're going to have somebody on from from uh, from Glen Marangi uh, in May, like I said, for that series, which is different from this. It's not kind of a class for the cocktails, but it's kind of a pull back the kimono kind of thing where we really get a little more, you know, inside baseball -y about drinks, drinking brands and that kind of stuff. Next week is Copper and Kings, uh, which is a brandy from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and next month we're going to be doing brandy cocktails on this series. I know I said a lot of things there. I hope it wasn't too confusing. <laughs> um, but you can always check our, our website and social media for stuff or if what I've just said confuses everybody, please just reach out. Uh, I'm starting to be in a crowded bar here, so or at least with employees. So if it gets hard to hear me, that's what's going on. Uh, but before I go, I certainly want to thank Dan. And Dan, did you have anything else you wanted to really kind of send home? Uh, yeah, we're, we're really looking forward to the event. I believe uh, my colleague, David Blackmore, and myself will be on that event in May. Uh, so we're really looking forward to that. Uh, Shannon, what you do in terms of your of your insights and dedication to trying to build uh, uh, synergistic experiences around the base spirit, uh, those insights and that creativity are what this is all about. Uh, single malt scotch whiskey isn't isn't a thing that necessarily occurs to somebody. They wake up in the morning like, oh, to today's the day I start being a single malt fan. It <laughs> might be cocktails, uh, gin, uh, straight bourbon, straight rice, uh, lots of different spirits types rely on cocktails to introduce people to the category in the first place. And, uh, and insightful applications of those base spirits in creative cocktails is, is where the door gets as wide open as it gets. So what you do, what you've built, uh, the, the care, passion, and insight that you bring to this is absolutely critical to the industry and to uh, to consumers everywhere to try to make this stuff real and, and, and try to introduce the idea that it can enhance the quality of anybody's life as long as they're 21 and over. Uh, we are we are all in your debt uh, for what you do uh, oh, thank you. Uh, there at Alley 26. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Really, thank you um, for all that. And of course, your time for tonight and uh, for repping brands we can get behind. Uh, if you're interested in our Industry Insider Series, please check in. It's usually Tuesday, uh, a bunch of Tuesdays. And all the events are on our, our face, have Facebook links or on our page. On our page, I'm, I'm getting a Claire here who basically does all the work. Um, I just sit here and make drinks, is telling me what to say. And it's our Facebook page has all of these events and please tune in all of the industry insider stuff is free uh and we're just we're going to do some cocktails during those as well because it's what we do uh but that's more of a like i said kind of nuts and bolts thing and then every month we're going to do one of these classes where we walk through technique and uh we we really celebrate one cocktail and we have more time for uh the banter and the specific technical questions if, so, Shannon, yes, ma'am. Are you going to keep doing these going forward, or once the restaurant reopens, will this not happen anymore? Uh, we're going to keep doing it. Uh, it's amazing. We do this privately as well. Thank you, Patrick. Um, we do this privately as well for groups, and we thought it was going to start slowing down right about now. But if anything, poor Claire <laughs> is busier than uh, any human being should be because we. We have a lot of, uh, of private classes to do. And the, this series seems to be gaining momentum as well. And we, the Industry Insider series is getting a really good feedback for us. So I'm having a bar built in the basement so that when this bar is open full tilt, we can still shoot these, uh, but not in the part of the basement that had bad Wi-Fi. Um, so we're gonna continue to be able to do this going forward. And hopefully folks from Massachusetts uh, can still, you know, tune in and we can still say hi. And maybe we can convert you to something else. <laughs> We're down. We're down. Keep it up. Outstanding. Thank you. Okay. Well, then I'm, I'm going to peel off if, if we're good. I'm going to leave the chat open. A lot of times there's families. Katadis, I'm talking to you. Uh, families and other folks that, that are on these. And if you guys want to chit chat with each other, you're welcome to. Uh, there's no reason to not. 
So a heartfelt thank you, A, for tuning in, B, for your patience with our Wi-Fi kerfuffle at the beginning. Huge thank you to Dan uh, for all the insights and everything. And um, till next time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Enjoyed it. Hey, Chuck. Hey, Chuck. Hey, that's my dad on the screen. How's it going? Hey, Alyssa. Good. How are you hey guys? Hey there. How are you guys? I love that. Katana <laughs> the dogs. Yeah. There's lots of other people joining us, so be careful what you say. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. They just have four dogs saying hello as well. The meal in the dog in the background joining in. Yeah, we've been on mute with a dog. Because, but yeah, she's finally she's Claire Katadi there pulling her mask down. I, oh, Sean Claire, oh. what's up? Hey Claire. Hey Claire, how are you? <laughs> Thank you. Well, sounds like you're really busy.